All right, recording. Dr. Matthew T. Siegel, welcome aboard. It's great to be aboard, uh, Gordon. I uh, am really honored by uh, your invitation to speak today and, and look forward to uh, picking each other's brains, maybe playing each other's uh, astral harps uh, strings yeah. or, uh, you know, whatever ways that we can um, meet in the midst of the metaphysical and the mysterious. Uh, I think it's going to be fun. No, absolutely. And as people can probably tell if they're watching this on the video, I'm traveling. This isn't the usual office. I'm in an Airbnb. Uh, one of the reasons we're doing video is uh, it's kind of easier for me to edit that, which is somewhat ironic, I guess, as as we as I move about the world, going to family events and so on. And uh, and it kind of occurred to me one of the one of my goals or plans for Q4 was to have a number of video discussions, almost like. And this is kind of sexy, but like philosophers we sleep on. Because I was thinking about the, the triple header I had, and I asked Brant Stickley that, like, do you think we sleep on Gebs here? And he says, absolutely. So I think um, once we get the traditional first question out of the way, Matt, I think I'm going to ask you if we sleep on Whitehead. But um, first of all, Matt, were you a weird kid? Very much so. Um... I was very quiet as a kid. I often wanted to hang around the adults more than the other kids. <laughs> and um, yeah, people tended to think that I was weird. I'd get asked if I was okay. They, people thought I seemed sad. I wasn't sad. I wasn't a sad kid. I was just a quiet kid. And, um, and I, by seven years old, was already kind of contemplating death. First, my own mother's death and then realized shortly thereafter that I was going to die too. And I think that sort of um, relationship to topics that people generally, I have a Mercury Pluto square in my chart. Uh, and so I'm very interested in the things that most people don't want to look at. That's what I really mm -hmm. have always wanted to think about. And so that, ha that made me weird from the beginning. Yeah, I like the um, the death thing because I I'll, I'll ask I'll, I'll get you to explain more on that, but I'll begin with my anecdote. A little bit older, about nine, I remember crying because I wasn't going to die, or more specifically, I was going to continue to exist because I was so tired, and I, just the idea <laughs> that this some sort of continuity. I had this weird moment as a nine-year-old going like, it, it, life continues in some form after death was sort of vaguely aware or, or satisfied at that point. I kind of lost it a bit and came back to it in my teen years. Um, but I was so tired. I'm like, oh God, there's like <laughs> not even a moment of rest. And that's kind of interesting. That was my version of the sort of pre-10 attempting to conceptualize death. I, I it, it exhausted me that there was going to be some form of continuity. I mean, how did you land it? You, you landed on it a bit younger, but how did you land on the idea of death as a seven-year-old? Well, not in uh, too dissimilar a way. I mean, the fact, it, it was obvious to me from the first time I turned to face death as a seven-year-old that it couldn't be an end. Uh, it must be, there must be some sort of continuation. It just, it made me question who I thought I was. You know, what is it that continues is the question that you're faced with when you confront death. Um, because yeah, I, I knew that my, I didn't have the terminology, like my ego, you know, as a seven year old, I, I hadn't yet, uh, <laughs> learned about psychoanalysis or I had no sense of, um, consciousness about my own psychology yet, but I knew that it was, death was a transformation. It was not an end. And that was really a doorway into the metaphysical in general, because, you know, to do philosophy, to ask questions about the nature of reality is necessarily to step outside of, of your finite uh, skin encapsulated ego, as Alan Watts used to call it. Um, and so, yeah, yeah um, death is not the end. No, it's funny, you, like, it's weirdly bringing up memories of stuff that I hadn't thought about that for years, right? But so the primary school I went to in Newcastle, Australia, 
um, years before, so in the late 70s, so quite a bit before I joined, the Lord Mayor of Newcastle, um, his daughter was going to the school and she died tragically in the 70s sometime, being hit by a car being picked up at the school gate. And her name was Jenny and there's like a Jenny's corner at the school and so on. But the legend was, and I have some childhood memories that suggest it was sort of true that there is some kind of haunting or Jenny presence at the primary school. So the kind of the pre-10, certainly without any kind of psychoanalysis idea of what it was that survives, it's like, do you think, do you think a nine-year-old Gordon or an eight year old Jenny is the eternal form and I do remember grappling with that I'm like well what is my mother my mother in the afterlife I remember trying to get my head around that and I think that might have been one of the reasons it was so exhausting it's like ah oh, this is too much yeah it's um you know, a question that I think you know for me when I first contemplated my own death um, well, sorry, initially I contemplated my mother's death and I was really sad about that. Um, I actually, I was like, I think I was in first grade, uh, as a seven year old and I, I would fake a stomach ache and cry and to get my teacher to send me, you know, to, to the nurse and they could call my mom and she could come get me. Cause I was just so worried. She was not going to be there when I got home. Wow. Uh, and this lasted for like a week. But then at the end of that week, I realized that I was going to die too. And that became the more, um, rather than sadness, it, it opened me to this sense of wonder, uh, this sense of mystery and not really knowing who I was. But it, it actually started me asking questions about, about who I was and um, questions about what this is, you know, like, mm -hmm. uh, and so it's, it's, it made me weird. It, yeah. Uh, so is that is that your philosopher origin story, question one? And two, were you sort of sequentially aware of that as you went from like 10? Is it like, okay, well, I'm going to, one way or the other, I'm going to get to the bottom of this. And did you sort of know that going through your teen years and up into your education? Or is it more like you you hit some points in your career where you sort of went backwards in your memories and said, actually, this this has some resonance to my um, seven-year-old conundrum. Yeah, well, I think, and here again, astrologers will recognize the Saturn quarter cycles. Um, as a 14-year-old, I remember experiencing depression for the first time, uh, even like suicidal ideation. You know, I never attempted or was really serious about it, but, you know, I started thinking like, oh man, I just want to end it. Like you were saying, this mm. is exhausting. It's exhausting. <laughs> get that That's... High, high school as a you know a 14 year old and you know i'm queer as well so uh bisexual and and the, trying to make sense of that in the context of high school with all of the politics of becoming uh, uh an autonomous rational adult which is what they were telling us we needed to do and uh it made me want to at least think about what it would be like to kill myself but then i remembered my seven-year-old experience of continuity and that death is not the end. And so my 14 year old uh, depressed, um, suicidally ideating self was like, well, this isn't going to solve my problems. So I, I should, you know, try to find some way to enjoy uh, life. And it, it took me a while, but uh, I, I think I found a way. <laughs> nice. uh, yeah. Maybe it took well, until I was 21, which the yeah. next, the next <laughs> quarter cycle of Saturn. <laughs> yeah. So did you, um, was there any phase where you wanted to be something like a fireman or did was this kind of what you thought you were going to do? I never wanted to be a fireman um, or a policeman or anything like that. There was, a, I guess when I was a eight, nine, 10 year old, I thought more about being a scientist. Mm -hmm. um, I hadn't really been exposed to the idea of a philosopher uh, in elementary school. Um, no, imagine that. Yeah. yeah, scientists though. Yeah, I was like, oh, that sounds cool. Um, and then I started playing sports. I played uh, hockey uh, as a teenager and um, got really into that. I'm pretty small. I'm like five six, but uh, it was quick. And um, I stopped growing though at like fourteen and realized I was never gonna. Even though I wanted to be, I dreamt of being a professional uh, NHL 
player or something. It wasn't in the cards. And uh, so it wasn't until, you know, my late high school years when I was starting to have to give up playing hockey um, that I realized I wanted to be a teacher mm-hmm. and get paid to have deep, to, to enter into deep dialogue with other people who are interested and crazy enough to go into debt to, <laughs> to study <laughs> uh, philosophy. Um, so it's, yeah, I'm very lucky to, to have been able to pursue a calling that really was seated um, yeah. many, many years ago. There's some resonance there, I think, because I wanted to be, never wanted to be a fireman or policeman either, but I wanted to be specific scientists because I misunderstood science and I was probably looking for philosophy right so I wanted like most kids although again this is astrologically significant and I ended up like I'm basically married to the sea but I wanted to be a marine biologist Uh, and I also wanted to be and I've told this story before what I misunderstood an environmental engineer to be because I didn't know permaculture existed so I wanted to be um, I wanted to look at systems and frameworks that could be regenerative and, and flourishing and whatever. And I thought that was an environmental engineer rather than what they actually do, which is build stormwater drains by business parks, right? Um, and then so I sort of lost that and decided I wanted to have adventures. And so I studied film to do documentary. So I, I needed some way that I could have adventures that would be paid for. And then I sort of settled for, well, actually I can pay for them myself. I just need to move around. But it's funny, the, there's, a, there's a similar beginning point, which is a, a marine biologist or what I thought an environmental engineer was, is that same um, contact with the more than human for mutual benefit thing <laughs> that I'd been looking for. And, uh, you know, kids are dumb, but I guess they're also kind of smart. Hey. Um. Yeah, I think dumb and smart are adult ideas. I think kids are just creative and and curious. And uh, mm. after decades of schooling, they either become dumb or smart. Um, but even some very smart adults can be boring and dull and have lost their childhood creativity. So, um, you know, I'm I'm I can I can relate to what you're saying about. Uh, about the ocean though and and being you know i was drawn to the sciences even as late as my undergrad year i mean i'm still drawn to the sciences i'm not a scientist but yeah and i didn't end up wanting to specialize in in a particular scientific discipline Uh, i chose philosophy because i wanted to study all the sciences yeah um I think what I was looking for in my understanding of science was philosophy. That's kind of your point. Like in primary school, you don't encounter this, the notion of a philosopher and there's a whole bunch of reasons. Again, I do, I blame Wittgenstein for a lot of it, but um, there's a whole bunch of reasons why you don't get it as a kid, but I think you yearn for it. Like what I wanted from marine biology and environmental engineering was um, meaning and understanding through contact basically. <laughs> and I thought that's what science was and it should be slash could be, right? But it's certainly not um, what's on offer in the majority of cases, I think. So it's almost like 10-year-old Matt had a better understanding of science. <laughs> well, yeah, because like 19-year-old Matt uh, taking an astronomy course at university uh, was so confused that he didn't, you know, I was like, oh, I should be an astronomer studying the stars. Like that can meet this need I have for wonder but then I also was like oh maybe I should drop out of school and sell my car and fly to India and 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 seek a guru uh or or maybe I should uh enroll in 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 a theological uh school or or study the Torah and become a rabbi like I I was uh really mixed up as an undergraduate and I think I finally landed on um philosophy because uh, it let me do everything. Yeah, <laughs> you, you, got, you, you got your Goldilocks career. I'm into it. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to ask, that because I'm sure you remember your first encounter with Whitehead. But before we do, I want to ask, was Whitehead a weird kid? Um, we don't know as much about his biography as I would like. But uh, I think he was not really a weird kid. He came from a family. Uh, his grandfather was uh, a, an Anglican 
schoolmaster and his father was an Anglican schoolmaster and uh, Whitehead uh, was um, from the moment he was born in school, you know, already as an infant, right, in this context. And uh, he was apparently a star rugby player uh, uh, as a as a older, uh, adult, you know, adolescent and into uh, college. And he seemed to fit in pretty well. He seemed to have um, a capacity for, you know, he wasn't like autistic or something or a savant where he was just this weird intellectual math mathematical genius who couldn't relate to people. That, that doesn't seem to have been the case. Um, but certainly he did have a gift as well and he shot into the Royal Society and became a, a Don at Cambridge um, naturally as if without even having to try. Uh, invented a new branch of mathematics called universal algebra. And, you know, this was um, all before uh, the turn of the 20th century. Uh, mm. so, Amazing, really. Yeah, like, yeah. if you're if you're of Anglican lineage and good at rugby, you, um, doors open for you uh, <laughs> at, at elite colleges. <laughs> so I see what you mean. He, he, not only did he not stand out, he that's quite good at fitting in uh, in an English context at the time, especially a middle class English context. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, but certainly, you know, if you ask Whitehead's good friend uh, Bertie Bertrand Russell, Whitehead referred to him as Bertie. Uh, Russell would say that Whitehead was quite weird, and and that especially his later philosophy, you know, once he left mathematics and physics, or really there's, con you know, he's still doing mathematical physics in his later philosophy, but um, from Russell's point of view, Whitehead's organic realism or philosophy of organism is, is rather strange indeed and offended uh, his uh, British sensibilities for, you know, desire for economy uh, and clarity. Um, so, Normal kid maybe fit in, but his philosophy has been uh, and continues to be quite heterodox and uh, an outlier, um, even though I'm encouraged and uh, excited to say, I think it's being, it's it's beginning to be, uh, to seep into the mainstream yeah, yeah, in yeah. interesting ways. It's interesting, like, um, and one, fuck Bertie for everything, but two, <laughs> um, there's a Krishnamurti angle to um, Russell thinking Whitehead is weird because that, because he's maladjusted to a, um, I, I would argue, like a horrible um, metaphysical framework. Uh, but, and this is a, a Whitehead observation, it is further, he was further in line with like literally the majority of the population of the planet, both then and now in their kind of felt understanding of what <laughs> this all is so yeah fuck buddy that's cool <laughs> well there's one thing i agree with russell about that i don't agree with whitehead about and that is um russell's anti-war activism yeah fair enough fair enough <laughs> all right they kind of you can't be universally bad um, yeah that's cool. uh where, i presume college but like where slash when did you first encounter him and was there this awareness at the time like oh I might be into this or because it's quite like there's something Russell's correct about that it is if you're if you're raised in um quote-unquote western epistemologies the first time you hit Whitehead you're like what the fuck <laughs> what are you talking about because you you, yeah. you basically have to examine very often for the first time how it is we um verify truths that we then put together and so like Whitehead requires you to do two like that and then or in the same time encounter him is, is at least what happened to me when I encountered him at university. But was there something like that for you where you're like, wow, I might be into this? Um, I'm pretty sure the first time I heard Whitehead's or read Whitehead's name was in um, a philosophical logic course that I took as an undergraduate and uh, Whitehead was mentioned in the context of his co-authored uh, text. Uh, I think the first edition was in 1905, uh, the, uh, the Principia Mathematica. Mm -hmm. uh, he and Bertrand Russell, who was his student at the time, 
uh, worked on this together. They were trying to ground mathematics. They chose a very simple mathematical statement, one plus one equals two, and they wanted to ground it in logic. And the first volume was like, all right, off to a good start. Second volume was like, oh, there's some problems here. Third volume was like, well, maybe we can't accomplish what we thought, but there's this other cool stuff. And then the project kind of, um, uh, it failed, right? And so, you know, in, in this logic course, they mentioned Whitehead in this context and that that project of that Russell and Whitehead worked on together was the founding basically of analytic philosophy, uh, which, which continues in much of England and the United States uh to be the dominant academic school of philosophy now i didn't know that there was a much cooler and weirder side to whitehead which was his later philosophical work you know after the principia project fails russell and whitehead parted ways um you know the first world war also occurred and they parted ways on that as well as i hinted at before but um, there were also deeper metaphysical disagreements. Whitehead was liberated by the failure of this project to reduce everything to logic. Russell was frustrated by it and wanted to come up with some sort of band-aid or patch to fix it. Um, and so I, I only was clued into the more interesting side of Whitehead, his cosmology, his, his, um, metaphysical scheme later on in the context of my psychedelic mm -hmm. research and experimentation because I listened to a lot of Terence McKenna lectures and read McKenna's books and he's got a chapter on organismic thought um, I think it's in the invisible landscape and and he's dropping Whitehead's name and using his vocabulary in, in a lot of his lectures and uh, all of a sudden my curiosity was sparked and so um, I started to look into him more and I was warned by people who have read his books that you shouldn't do it alone. It's kind of like mm -hmm. when you take acid for the first time, you might want a sitter. Uh, to read Whitehead for the first time, you might want the help of a reading group or a graduate course. Uh, and so I ended up not studying Whitehead uh, formally, his later philosophy at least until graduate school when um, a wonderful teacher named Eric Weiss, uh, this was back in 2008, uh, he, he offered a course on Whitehead's philosophy uh, at CIIS. Um, Eric actually passed away recently. Uh, and you know, I think he was really instrumental in um, initiating me into the Whiteheadian cosmovision. And I've been obsessed ever since. I can't seem to, uh, to find something more worthy of my time and attention. Uh, you know, and I try to we read widely and, and very interested in the history of philosophy. And I don't like to be narrowly defined as a Whiteheadian philosopher. I think um, I'm just a philosopher sure. or any, if anything, I'm a Platonist. Um, sure. So. Um, well, I'm glad you, I'm glad you brought that up because um, I want to ask about most people know him, and in fact, most people have encountered him through Ter Terence McKenna's um, agreeing with the footnotes to Plato comment, which of course is the name of your website and, and you on Twitter and so on. So I'll ask you that, but like, first I wanna go back to, do you think we sleep on him or do you think, as you just described, it's, um, it's challenging to um, be with Whitehead's concepts without um, a guide. <laughs> and so it's not necessarily that we sleep on him, but it's the, um, the barrier to entry is, is, is more challenging. Or do you think we literally sleep on him? Do you think it's like the, not, and when I say we, um, obviously in the quote unquote West um, does, although I, I agree with you, I think the 21st century is, is a coming around to vitalism and biology and so on in the way the 20th was physics. But um, I think in the broader me metaphysical community, do you think people are as aware of him as they um, should be, given that there's some valuable stuff in there? I don't think that academic philosophy is as aware of Whitehead as they should be, not at all. Um, you know, I think there are some encouraging trends um, in the last decade or so, but uh, 
still in so in analytic philosophy of mind um there's a lot of talk and excitement about panpsychism yeah. all of a sudden um people like philip goff uh and um and others uh uh galen strassen of course are making arguments, analytically rigorous, sophisticated arguments in response to the so-called hard problem of consciousness, uh, which blocks any materialistic explanation for why we are aware and awake. Um, Panpsychism is being offered as maybe one of the most coherent and parsimonious ways of addressing this problem. And all the while though, um, most of the time they're referring to Bertrand Russell instead of Whitehead mm -hmm. when they try to give examples of a panpsychist doctrine from the history of philosophy. So, you know, Russell had this neutral monism that he borrowed from William James, and it was sort of just a throwaway. It, it, he didn't have a sophisticated uh, uh, metaphysical scheme that, that sort of cashed out the implications. Uh, his best friend, at least until their uh, disagreements, uh, Whitehead, though, has this elaborate metaphysical scheme uh, that he claims is logically consistent uh, and coherent, and that it is empirically, empirically, empirically applicable and uh, experientially adequate. And it's just like laying there waiting for all of these analytic panpsychists to like take a look at, you know, a mathematician and a physicist who thought that he had articulated a panpsychist system more than a hundred years ago or basically a hundred years ago now uh and it's like it's just sitting there collecting dust like i don't understand why whitehead's not more a part of the conversation i grant that he's hard to understand and that's usually the excuse offered you know sometimes like galen strassen will mention like yeah and, and whitehead you know he wasn't just a logician he also had this beautiful but uh difficult to understand cosmology and he just leaves it at that it's like well heidegger's hard to understand too that yeah, doesn't true. exactly that doesn't stop people from reading him and and elaborating or interpreting his thoughts so it's time to read whitehead <laughs> i think but so because i said i said this to dr sheldrake when he was on the show as well and it's not that i dislike so anything that isn't materialist naturalism is an improvement. And I mean a vast improvement as far as I'm concerned. So when, when I'm kind of, we're going to talk about where panpsychism and panentheism and, and, and things like animism overlap and interact and have tension points. But the trouble, it seems to me, with publicly acceptable panpsychism is it's the finger in the dike. Like it's, it's still just moved the hard problem along. And I said that like, because... Uh, and Sheldrake likes to kind of pull at that finger by talking, you know, Susan Blackmore asking her, is the sun conscious then? And the, blah, 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 you know, can't, can't handle it. And that's kind of my problem with panpsychism. And it's why people, though, this is my take, right? It's why those who should know better won't approach something like Whitehead because the implications, you can say, fine, I'm panpsychist. I'm like, okay, pull on that thread, take that finger out of the dike because what you actually do then is, is flood into like basically a living universe, like a literally alive cosmos in one way or the other. And they're not ready for that. It's more like, ah, oh, I don't have to think about the hard problem now. I can have like a Lego block model of molecular complexity somehow correlating with a theory of mind or a conception of what mind is based on the human mind. So there's kind of like, it's better than materialist naturalism because everything is. Uh, but I, uh, my, my tension there, it, it is the one that I think is the same barrier for people not wanting to be Whiteheadian is that you, you have to sit with, and he's right, obviously, you have to sit with the idea that, um, okay, cool. So we have to fundamentally alter scientifically awareness, if not consciousness, right? Like mind. Uh, that you can't be half pregnant with that. And I think in a lot of cases, panpsychism is an attempt to be half pregnant. I mean, it, it need not be. I think the implications are in there. But do you find that with people who are kind of officially and acceptably panpsychists that they, they haven't worked out they live in a haunted universe? Yeah, well, I think the reason we have a word panpsychism and a different word animism is that panpsychism supposed to be just this disinterested theory about the nature of reality 
whereas animism implies a, a, a way of life, a practice, a, an ethics, uh, a, a relationship with a, a larger community of life, of, of, of agencies that are mostly not human. <laughs> yep. um, and so, yeah, I think, um, you know, some critics of panpsychism, though, which I, it is, it's a gateway drug to animism, I would say. Yes, the, I think so. And the, the wedge. Yeah. Yeah. Critics of panpsychism, though, they say things like, um, um, well, isn't that comforting? Like, oh, yes, the universe is alive and uh, death is an illusion. And isn't that nice? It makes you feel good. But actually, no, I think if you if you really live into the implications, the existential implications of panpsychism, they're absolutely terrifying to like, modern sensibility. <laughs> That one's the classic conspiracy theory thing. And it's a shit don't stink argument because, oh, isn't that comforting? You mean like the mainstream media narrative as, as like this um, really dumbed down version of the world. The same thing you turn around to materialists and go, oh, isn't it comforting to know everything? Isn't it comforting that you have confidently worked out the entire universe and you no longer have to think about it? That looks more like comfort to me than sitting with the not just implications, but the responsibility and the Harawayan response ability that comes from being a citizen of a community of beings, which is the cosmos, right? So it's like, oh, isn't that comforting? Isn't that comforting that you don't have to think about it? Drill, baby, drill. Yeah, no, exactly. And um, I think I see my role as, you know, I, I, I have one foot in the academic world and I have one foot in the uh I don't know what it is, philosophy in the wild or whatever it is that we do uh, online. Um, and I, I, I see my role as, as trying to, um, A, remind the panpsychists in among analytic philosophers what the implications of this view are really, um, not just as a hypothesis, but as a, a, as a, as a way of life, as an ethics, uh, as a spirituality um and also to argue with materialists not because they're going to be convinced uh of the stupidity uh of their view but um because other people are listening who haven't yet formed their opinions yeah. uh, but it also and, sharpens yours up like i like it I, we just finished up the custodianship course right and i used when it comes to making place and habitat and home gaston bachelard says that your home makes sense of storms and storms make sense of your home right uh, and I think that can, if you do it with the right awareness or heart, that can happen when you encounter disagreement, like you, you make sense of the storm. It's like, okay, well, let's actually have a decent and, uh, and, and open and frank thrashing out of where materialism and various versions of living cosmoses, panpsychism, animism, or whatever, meet and don't meet because it's that's how, that's an experience. That's how you learn. So I think it's good stuff. I've certainly watched some of your uh, videos online about doing that, but we're sort of this far in and I'm, I bet you could ask this all the time. And I, I wonder, I'm very interested to hear your off the shelf or refined answer of like, well, what is not, not what did Whitehead believe, but like, what was Whitehead's cosmology or how do you, like when people say, oh, you know, when you're in those conversations, like, oh, I, I kind of lecture on a bunch of stuff, including, you know, Whitehead's philosophy. And they're like, okay, well, what's Whitehead's philosophy? Do you have like a, a, a tight explanation that you give for people who are coming at Whitehead cold? Yeah, sure. Um, Whitehead's philosophy is an attempt to integrate uh, the 20th century revolutions in physics I mean, that's what brought him into philosophy and cosmology in the first place. The destruction of the old Newtonian clockwork mechanistic picture of the universe, quantum theory and relativity theory uh, required a new metaphysics and Whitehead was right at the, he was one of the few mathematicians uh, in the English speaking world who could understand Einstein's equations and, and papers uh, after the special and general theory were published. You know, he was in close dialogue with Sir Arthur Eddington and, and other physicists uh, trying to make sense of the implications of what Einstein was suggesting. And Whitehead even offered his own alternative theory of 
general relativity um, and in a way provided the uh, kind of grand unifying theory that physicists are still looking for. It's just that Whitehead, Whitehead's was an event ontology uh, and physics has remained stuck in a substance ontology um, at most of physics, at least people like Lee Smolin are trying to say, Hey, time is real too. And process yeah. is real. And, you know, so Whitehead was coming at the, 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 the search for a grand unifying theory from a different process oriented perspective and physicists are still trying to do it in a different way. But um, so this is a long answer, I know, but basically no, Whitehead, it's, good. No, it's, it's really useful. Yeah. He's, he's trying to provide a new metaphysical background for the 20th century revolutions in physics. And he's trying to critique the bifurcation of nature, as he called it, that separates mind from matter, or, um, but that separates nature as it appears and uh, the perception, the perceptual experience in which it appears. Modern philosophy has separated these two things. Um, and Whitehead's saying, no, there is no separation. Our perception of the sunset and its beauty and its color is just as much a part of nature as are the electric fields uh, and the radiant energy and so forth that, that the physicist would want to describe it in terms of perception, feeling, uh, and energy are equally natural in Whitehead's mm -hmm. universe, right? And so he tried to bring forth a cosmological scheme, a scheme that was consistent with physics, consistent with our aesthetic experience, uh, our, our, the phenomenology of being human, being a living that, organism. So, oh, sorry, because um, I'll lose this thought otherwise. Is that where he principally, would he, like, like the footnotes of Plato comment? Is it because of that? Is it because that um, Plato asserts that, um, you know, beauty is is real? <laughs> you can actually encounter it and that is part of reality, right? Is that why, I mean, talk us through, If unless you finish off your thoughts, sorry, I just wanted to put that in there because it hadn't occurred to me until you just said it. That might've been, one of the impetuses behind perhaps the most famous comment in 20th century philosophy, really. Yeah. Go on. Yeah. Well, Whitehead's a Platonist. He's a, uh, as um, Sam Webster, I guess I had on, on my channel a couple of months ago, put it, he's a neo, 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 neo Platonist. Uh, in other words, there've been these sort of seven major uh, inflection points in the history of Platonism uh, where Plato's original teachings, I guess Socrates originally, and then how it was rediscovered and re-implemented in different periods. So um, Whitehead thinks ideas are real, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, what is it that is so alluring about uh, the sunset? What is, what is it that is so majestic and sublime about uh, seeing the Milky Way and, and, and the night sky in a place without light pollution? Um, for for Whitehead, as for Plato, it's these are these are um, experiences pointing us toward an ideal world. Uh, they are beautiful because they partake in the idea of beauty. Uh, and so, from Whitehead's point of view, to talk, you know, and Whitehead makes very clear the ways in which contemporary physics is um, rather idealistic. I mean, the search for the ultimate structure of reality in terms of mathematical yeah, exactly. formulas, you're calling that materialism? I mean, yeah. hello, I think you're confused. Um, so Whitehead's not an idealist though, in the sense that idealism would be a school of thought that rejects the reality of um, the, the non-human world, that, that rejects the reality of um, a, hmm, how to articulate Whitehead's realism. His, his realism comes through in his sense that each individual organism is embedded in a network of relationships with other individual organisms, right? Yep. And neither the network or the individual has precedence. They arise together, they're co-creating. Uh, and so he's a realist in the sense that he thinks we're never gonna be done 
relating to others, right? He's not a monist uh, in the sense that everything reduces to the absolute in some idealistic sense. He's a realist in that he wants to preserve the, the sort of plurality and multiplicity that, uh, that is required for relationship to be possible. Yeah, that's cool. I'm glad you made that distinction because um, I, and I also like the neo, 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 neo Platonist <laughs> notion because I like Plato mostly. I dislike what we call academically anyway, the neo Platonists. And I think it, it's sort of unfair to blame Plato for what happened centuries later, but coming back to that monist idea, and I, I dislike it because you wouldn't have had um, Descartes and the validation of truth that powered the age of reason which powered empire um if we weren't if, if philosophy wasn't footnotes to plato and in that case i mean it in a bad sense because by the time you get to the neoplatonists you do you take a step beyond white uh, beyond plato saying ideas are like white like real in some way there is a there is an ideal component to the cosmos to instead of horizontalizing it, it's vertical and it's perfect and it's unchanging. And that's a guess. And the trouble is when you get to that, um, that period of immense doubt that actually gave us the enlightenment, like the rediscovery of skepticism that eroded um, the truths of the beginning of the late, well, the 16th, 17th century. Um, there is this unexamined assumption that it, it's not necessarily we don't, we don't trust our senses. It's that we don't trust our senses to tell us true things about a true and unchanging world. And so they, they build these mind games that allow them to make true statements that we build the age of reason on. And I, I, it seems to me that the error is this unfounded assumption of, of like the true must be eternal and unchanging. And, and it's like you could, the true should actually be the, um, should be eternally changing <laughs> instead, right? And so it's, it's funny, I was thinking as I was putting the questions together, footnotes to Plato, he means it in a, at least I assume, in a good sense. Um, and it is meant in a good sense and it's, it's a valid statement, but it also, um, un it is also unfortunately true that Western philosophy is basically footnotes to Plato because it, there are some assumptions there that, you don't, and funnily enough, Descartes the same, right? Like I actually don't, I don't blame Descartes for the taxonomical logic that powered empire and botany and, and stealing countries. I don't blame him for it. I blame the lesser minds that um, kind of ran with their interpretation of his ideas. And I think Neoplatonism for me <laughs> is the same where you, they have to argue about, you, you end up famous arguments about, well, do we need theurgy or can we just think our way to truth? And you go, wait a minute, somewhere along the line, you have missed the validity of lived experience. If you guys have to pass letters backwards and forwards about whether there is an association between what theurgy is effectively um, body movement and truth. And, it, and so it's, it's interesting to think of like the negative side of the footnotes to Plato comment. I don't know, what do you reckon? Um, well, and I think of Carl Jung, who once said, I'm glad I'm not a Jungian. I think Plato would have said, I'm glad mm -hmm. I'm not a Platonist. Um, and for him, you know, school doesn't mean you repeat exactly what the teacher thought. School means you continue in engaging in the process of learning. And, uh, you know, so uh, I think of Emerson, who said that... Uh, all the best refutations to Plato's ideas are in Plato's dialogues. Um, yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> so that you shouldn't, we shouldn't read his dialogues as if they were doctrines. Um, rather, embedded in the dialogues are provocations uh, to thought and to thinking. Uh, and uh, uh, hidden in those dialogues are a kind of um, call to engage in certain practices of thought and thinking that are transformative uh, and that bring about insight of some kind. And so, you know, I, I think you know, there's the platonic um, ideas or the, the, the theory of forms or whatever. And I think uh, 
what does Plato mean by that? Um, I think if you read a dialogue like the symposium that focuses on Eros, you get a very different conception of uh, what an idea is and how we human beings can participate uh, in the ideal realm. Mm. You get a sense of, of, of a, a version of Platonism that isn't so disembodied and that isn't so otherworldly, but that is in fact um, only trying to say that the beauty we perceive in bodies is uh, not merely material. Yep. That's all. Yeah. Uh, and so I don't think we need to get carried away with the, the dualism of um, an ideal world and a merely material world or an idea of, of a world of static essences and uh, uh, a world of perishing uh, physical things. Absolutely. So Plato, yay, Neoplatonist, nay. And it's not just, and it's funny, like coming back to if you could sum up no, it's not even fair. Like a, a, a valid platonic statement is that ideas are real. And if you look at the process, as you say, Plato wouldn't have wanted people to be learning from his documents. He would have wanted them to read the notion that ideas are real and to encounter them. So it's, that's, the, that's the bit that I find troubling in the split. But I also think that unexamined um, dualism keeps showing up because we keep doing it. We keep... Um, canonizing and this is the i use this all the time the difference between what we want from indigenous thought and what we get is um we want his thoughts or we use his thoughts rather than his way of thinking and that fucks everything up <laughs> and that's kind of why i, I don't know if, if um white had ever if that was contained or implied in his all the philosophies footnotes of plato comment, but it, it, it certainly is when I sit with the idea, there's the good side of it, which is we in fact have um, at, at, the, at the almost like the fountainhead or source of, of what we call Western philosophy, um, the idea that ideas are real, but we also have the, okay, but then we're, the improper implications of that have ossified and given us uh, and give and inflicted upon the world some not great stuff, <laughs> I think. Yeah, well, I mean, every Platonist needs uh, some Aristotle in their lives, which mm -hmm. is to say that, um, you know, the way Whitehead talks about it is that he says that Plato is uh, about dialectical speculation. And in other words, um, conjecture restrained only by the need to justify oneself in a, in a rational exchange with somebody, an interlocutor who doesn't necessarily already agree with you, right? Plato's dialogues are just speculate and defend, speculate and defend. And most of them end in aporia or in uncertainty, like, well, that was interesting. I still have no idea what's going on. You know, that's, that's pretty much the refrain at the end of every platonic dialogue or some kind of a myth that's supposed to reveal the transrational nature of the argument that couldn't quite be articulated um, explicitly. And do, do we miss the a sense that that's, I think we do, uh, but I'll, I'll put it to you as a question this way, that it, that was an embedded praxis given how extremely likely it was Socrates and Plato and all their kind of like pedo pals were members of mystery traditions. So it's kind of taken as a given as everyone is, um, in this discursive context, grappling with reality, that the reality that they're, this discursive context or this praxis is embedded in some like givens, like that, the, uh, that life continues in some form after death, like our pre-10 realizations are kind of there. And I don't think, because um, it seems to me, there, there are many critiques of like Socratic method and like the good, whatever contained within the Socratic method is the capacity to, or the invitation to critique it even. But I think what people miss is that's done by people who know that they continue after death. Like that, that mm. what they're do doing is, is, is like, is a form of ritual, uh, a ritual in a living universe. And I just kind of, I wonder, what do you think? Do you think that it, um, it, almost, it almost capitalizes the process again for me to realize that it's extremely likely 
that uh, they weren't deciding like whether God was real or whether we continue after death or any of that. It, it, it's the most hilarious thing to me about um, the Socratic turn and, and that moment is that it happened. It's almost like they didn't even bother with like stuff that we bother with. Do you know what I mean? Hmm. Well, yeah, they still had, you know, as Owen Barfield or Rudolf Steiner might say, they had a residual participation in the intelligible order of the cosmos <laughs> and yeah. mo modern people we don't we're not afforded that privilege anymore if we're going to participate in the intelligible structure of the world in the living soul of the cosmos we need to make an effort uh, 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 out of our own free will to do so whereas i think the ancient greeks still had some sort of automatic participation in that and they so they took for granted that there is a divine order and that the human soul somehow is uh, connected, that there's some kind of conduit, and that through these practices, we can uh, reliably, you know, establish contact with that realm and, and know something about nature because we're connected to its divine order. Um, all that gets called into question, I guess, with Descartes, maybe, maybe Bacon before Descartes, um, but that's when there's you're entering a period in the evolution of consciousness where the residual or original participation in Barfield's terms has faded. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's weird we're talking about this because I'm here finishing off the book and um, I was actually just last night playing with that bit in people associate the enlightenment with that kind of overconfident age of, age of reason stuff, but it's almost like it's an immune response to what happened just before it, which is calling all of that into question. Again, a necessary step because it did also call into question uh, ecclesiastical infallibility. Not that they were infallible in that sense, but the, the, um, the idea that previous things are um, true in a way that can't be critiqued or, or taken for granted and, and voices of authority and kingship. So necessary, um, necessary uh, encounter with that. Unfortunately, you almost have like a antibiotic resistant bacteria logic that comes out of it that can't be killed, which is that age of reason <laughs> logic. Uh, yeah. And that's kind of the, the point that um, I think is interesting there, but it's, it's there because at least in part, I think a misread of, um, or the presumption that the truth is um, difficult to get at um, with sense perception and that it must be like unchanging and, and kind of eternal, which mm -hmm. seems to me an assumption. Yeah. Well, I mean, just to close the thread from earlier, I think um, I said every Platonist needs some Aristotle because while Plato's really good at speculating um, and really good at sort of preserving wonder and mystery. Aristotle was really good at systematizing, at cataloging and classifying mm. uh, and uh, so tying up all the loose ends. And so uh, Aristotle gives us logic. He gives us the seed form of every science that we have today. Um, and so you need both of these capacities. Whitehead calls it the speculative school and the critical school. Um, you know, the critical school thinks that we've already finished the dictionary and the speculative school thinks that we need to keep adding new words to the dictionary uh, because we haven't yet finally settled accounts with the encompassing mystery. Uh, and so Whitehead counts himself a member of the speculative school, obviously, and is trying to enlarge the dictionary. And um, when you engage philosophy in that way, like not presupposing that you already have the right version of logic or you already have the conceptual tools at hand to solve the problems or the questions that you're asking, but rather you really treat metaphysics as an adventure that uh, really the search is for the right questions to ask rather than the solutions to um, like reheated uh, yeah you know, old questions. So um, when we talk about these big figures in the history of philosophy, like Plato or, or Aristotle or Descartes, they're profoundly ambiguous figures, right? They have, um, because they've had such a profound impact on 
how we even begin to think about what our situation is and as human beings. And so I think there's a lot in Descartes to be critical of. Sure. Um, the dualism, the mathematization of of knowledge and and nature. Um, it's it's almost like Descartes by applying his um, analytic geometry, uh, his 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 geometrical grid to the extended physical world, and saying that's all that that physical world is is this quantifiable, mathematizable uh, 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 scheme. Uh, he it's as if he was reducing nature to just pure knowability. It's just yes. pure matter awaiting the intelligence of the mind uh, to determine its its truth. And um, that is, it's actually madness. It's insanity. Yeah. It's, um, it's egomaniacal and mm -hmm. uh, it's very dangerous. And I think um, at the same time though, there's another part. I think Descartes' natural philosophy is, is deadly, literally deadly. But, but his, his understanding of the human soul and our, our psychology, I think, is a bit more, it, it has enduring value to us because unlike many of the modern philosophers and enlightenment thinkers who followed in his wake, Descartes still insisted that there is an infinite divine ground uh, lying sort of dormant in our own souls or that there's a divine spark in each of us is another way of thinking about it and that we have he thinks that he says this in his meditations right that he says uh i am more certain of the existence of god than i am even of myself yeah and i think to assert the idea of an autonomous ego or a, a even a, a thinking i um is as many secular liberal people do all the time, is is to forget what that presupposes, which Descartes lays out for us quite brilliantly, that we as finite individuals are entirely dependent upon an infinite divine being. Uh, and I think that aspect of Descartes remains uh, significant for us in our time. Totally. We've so forgotten it. He. Um... He was a good Catholic boy, right? This is sort of what I mean by uh, there was a moment when the sort of Renaissance rediscovery of original skepticism as a school um, in the next kind of 150 years started bulldozing all these um, stable, previously stable um, metaphysics. And, and he was in that world and he was a skeptic, like informed by, you know, he was, Pyronian as the rest of them, I guess, but like he was literally trying to save God. Like <laughs> he knew that God existed. And that's the point that I think people, this is I think what I mean by the um, antibiotic resistant bacteria metaphor is that in this great unleashing of skepticism in the original Greek sense and the guys, it, it, Descartes contemporaries were more stringent about it than the original skeptics. Um, you have this, in order to prove God, you basically have to sacrifice the cosmos. And, and he did that. <laughs> and it's sort of set out. And in order to do that, he had, to his mind, and, and from the point of view of uh, human awareness, as you say, it's, it's, it's good logic. Like you can't get behind the awareness of, uh, um, you can't get behind the awareness that you are doubting or, or what have you and, and, and those implications, but to kind of bring it all down to this point that is antibiotic resistant and, and to build a logic of what you think is true of this mathematical proving of things is how, like, the enlightenment is overconfident because it, it's, it, it's built on these sort of mathematical proofs that cannot be updated or disproved because of the way they're put together. And we get them because of <laughs> Descartes trying to save God from, uh, from the skeptics is, is kind of, um, it's kind of a read on, on that moment. So I'm kind of very interested in the, how did they get so confident? Because that's the, it's that confidence of the, um, 
it's that confidence that gave us the logic for empire, right? Because it's the it's the removal of context or the the non-physical and the the focus on the things that can be empirically demonstrated only in a, in a, in a physical sense. And we got that <laughs> because of this peculiar moment where they had to be. Yeah. Well, there had I, to be a response to skepticism. I mean, empire though precedes modernity. And I think sure. modernity, uh, modern rationalism gave a new justification for empire uh, different from the prior more theocratic forms of imperialism. Uh, but but empire wasn't invented by Cartesian logic. You know this goes this goes back uh, to I mean Timothy Morton says it's agro logistics that gives rise to empire. In other words, farming and the the creation of uh, a sense of separation between a city and the wild and the the use of technology to uh, extract food and other resources from the natural world. That that agricultural Neolithic revolution was the beginning of empire. And modernity is just a further elaboration upon that original sin. That's one sure, idea at least. But it's, it's sort of the difference between a penny farthing and a Tesla, right? <laughs> because the, um, the, the sort of mercantile expansion and, and, and European imperial project is like nothing <laughs> that had happened before. And it's the it's not even, although it is a moral justification, the imperial cosmology is 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 based on this uh, the unassailability of reason, right? Like so, you um, there is even words like landscape come with come with a European um, context or culture, but with if you if uh, if the non physical is or the immaterial is immaterial, then when you encounter great southern continents. The um, the context in which they um, you know its custodians are embedded isn't real, like <laughs> it's not real in in um, based on your age of reason epistemology. Like you literally cannot prove that those things are there. And moreover, the sort of self justification of the Enlightenment, even including the word, is that it had reached this. Um, it European thought had broken out into this new and modern era out of the delusions of the past and it, it was so you have this and it, it used its almost like mathematical logic to justify that and it was that impetus of like we are the modern in that latour sense right that in the sense that we haven't ever been modern that is the um inertia is the wrong word the momentum because you then, in, you, the immaterial is immaterial, but also you encounter deluded people. Um, and and you, it, that's the bit, that's why I think the European imperial expansion is the Tesla, because you don't, even if you look at how um, ancient Romans understood slavery, um, slavery is like a, oh, it's a weird way of saying it. Roman slavery was, particularly if you're in the city of Rome, almost like being a temporary resident, then a permanent resident, then a citizen in a, in, a, in a visa process. That's not how we did slavery most recently, right? And so that's the, that's the Tesla angle. And I'm, I, I don't blame Descartes for it. It's kind of like a Plato Neoplatonist situation. I think Descartes was a kind of immense genius. Mm -hmm. um, well, and there's no question that Descartes was part of a larger complex, uh, you know, he, Descartes was, was very valuable to uh, to generals and and state militaries because he knew a lot about ballistics and sure. helped them help them design weapons and uh, you know there's no question that modern science and colonialism and uh, capitalism and slavery are, are all intimately wed as part of this single yeah. uh, complex of, of imperial expansion. Um, I would just say that as at least based on the research that I've done, and it's, uh, you know, speculative philosophy is one thing, but I think there's just as much as, as much speculation when you're talking about uh, the history of the human species and uh, anthropology and archaeology and these things. But it seems that going back many tens of thousands of years, as humans left Africa, there were megafaunal extinctions, 
-hmm. and as as agriculture spontaneously emerged at different points on the planet independently at the, around the same time in north and south america in uh in uh, the mediterranean uh and and the middle east um that there were major climactic consequences and that human beings have been altering the climate for potentially way longer than just in the modern period, whether it's as a result of the, the disease vector from the old world to the new world that drove for probably 50 million Native Americans into extinction within 100 years uh, and led, you know, Latour writes about this and other geologists and earth systems theorists, the way that when the Native populations went extinct in the new world as a result of uh, these old world diseases from Europe, the forests that they had been maintaining all grew back, which sunk all the carbon, uh, which created a mini ice age in Europe. Um, you know, and, and then, then obviously industrialization happens and climate change as we usually think of it uh, starts to, to ramp up. But it seems that agriculture going back 8,000 years or so was already potentially altering True. the climate. I just don't think, so the trouble, and this is the um, animus permaculture angle, right? Um, Bill Mollison would say everything gardens. So we have this grain centrism of, um, we consider agriculture, and this comes back to the age of reason thing. We consider mm -hmm. agriculture to be what we understand, which is the use of um, land for growing an annual modified grass, wheat. But that's not how the majority of mankind, even now, well, actually, that's not true now, now that we have like dangerously so, like <laughs> only six um, main right. um, sources. Mono, of mono cropping, it would yeah. be a word But for before it. that, the, the, like, so it's not even, because I like do the um, Charles thing about say, I'm a climate denier. I don't think climate is real, not that I don't think we're warming the planet. <laughs> um, so that's my challenge with it's all well and good. It's like, I like Timothy Morton. Um, it's just a very obvious, it's, it's just re-describing that, well, that's when capitalism began argument, but it's not good enough for a living cosmos where we have been, and this, Bill Mollison's point was about New Guinean farmers, which is that in the mid 20th century, we spend 10 units of energy, so tractors and so on, bringing in one unit of food energy. He spends one unit of energy, a New Guinean gardener, going out and coming back with 10 units of energy. He said, so who's the more sophisticated agronomist? And we can't see that. It, it is to your point, which is that humans are in the context of all other persons. So like a, major, a majority of beings and we have, no, because I don't, I literally, it's a weird way of saying it. I literally deny climate, but humans have been as denizens of the planet, part of its, coming and going since we've been around and I absolutely full agreement on that which is also like one of the things I wanted to get to is uh, Whitehead's philosophy of organism right so and also I'll, I'll do a dual question because um how do you understand the relationship between imagination and nature right so philosophy of organism and then I want to embed that in in like a magical universe I think mm. Yeah, I mean, the simplest way to describe what Whitehead's philosophy of organism is suggesting is that rather than physics being the fundamental sort of ground level science, ecology becomes the, the most general science uh, in terms of which all the special sciences sort of fit in. Um, so rather than a reductionistic uh, sort of hierarchy where psychology reduces to biology, reduces to chemistry, reduces to physics, in Whitehead's philosophy of organism, ecology is the fundamental science, which is to say that finally what reality is about is the co-evolution of organisms in uh, an ecology. So, or in an environment, but the environment is always just other organisms. And there, are, for Whitehead, he says that uh, physics is the study of the smaller organisms mm -hmm. and biology mm -hmm. is the study of the mid-level organisms, astrophysics, tends to study the larger organisms, stars and galaxies and things like that. Uh, but it's all organisms all the way up, all the way down, where an organism is a, a self-organizing process with agency and feeling. And so we're not talking about machines. 
that are externally assembled rather um, either aimlessly by a natural selection or through some form of divine design as, as in creationism. That's not Whitehead's picture. Neither creationist, it's neither creationist nor uh, mechanistic. It's organic, which is to say that, yeah, organisms grow themselves. They don't need a, an external God to design them, and they don't need this abstract idea of natural selection as if purely through collisions that somehow organisms become human, conscious, intelligent agents. That, that's not how, Whitehead doesn't think that that's a coherent explanation mm. for conscious beings or living organisms at all, right? So he wants to imagine the universe from the very beginning as a process of organic evolution. And it, that process tends to complexify over time. Uh, otherwise we wouldn't be here. Absolutely. And imagination um, is Whitehead's primary way of knowing, I would say. And I would, I would approach imagination in this sense, you know, in the history of modern philosophy, there are these two major schools of thought, the rationalists and the empiricists, right? And the rationalists think that our, our sensory experience is basically confused and illusory. And what we really need to do is reflect on logic and mathematics and, and construct a coherent explanation for the world out of that. Uh, the empiricists say, no, all the ideas you think you have in your mind are just faded impressions from your sensory experience. And the best we can do is, uh, you know, try to get along in the world in a sort of more or less hedonistic way, um, avoiding pain, seeking pleasure. Uh, there are no higher ideals that we could aspire to. Let's just try to get along and, and do the best we can. Uh, and, you know, Whitehead is trying to engage our human condition in a realistic way. And for him, that means acknowledging that ideas are real, like the rationalists. It also means acknowledging like the empiricist that experience is real uh, and that we are embedded in a network of relationships that transcends us. And none of the ideas that we have on hand are ever going to exhaust that network of, of relationships that we're embedded in. And he tries to articulate a way of knowing that um, has a few sort of non-negotiable presuppositions. One is re relationality, and the other is uh, that everything is in process. Yeah. And so an imaginative way of knowing acknowledges that what's true today might not be true tomorrow. And there's a continual need to uh, engage in ongoing relationship in order to maintain truths that were established yesterday. If, if knowledge is a relationship, then truth is an event. And there are certain um, uh, sort of ritual practices that go into creating an event which is true or truthful. Uh, and it has for Whitehead everything to do with remaining in creative relational process with whatever it is that we're trying to know and abstract ideas and mere sensory perception are not enough to remain in deep relationship with with what is uh always arising in our experience and so you know for whitehead we engage imagination in search of um symbolic modes of perception that allow us to relate our experiences in uh, transrational ways that, that we can't necessarily um, prove with strict logic, but that nonetheless uh, are justifiable based on their experiential adequacy and, and based on their beauty, which if we're doing it well, if we're engaging imagination well in our philosophy, the beauty of it should be self-evident other people should be like, oh, that feels true. That feels right. That feels good. That feels beautiful. You know, it should be self-evident. That's the final proof for Whitehead. It's not logical deduction. It's uh, how does it feel, as Bob Dylan would say. It's, it's you know, uh, is it self-evidently the case? 
that this account of reality works for you. It validates your experience. It's adequate and applicable to the way that you move around the world and the beings that you encounter. Um, and so, yeah, imagination becomes the, the, uh, the, the faculty or the power uh, that is relevant, not just for, for poetry and art, but also for science uh, yeah. and, and for ethics. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely for ethics, right? So it, it's interesting. Um, ideas are real is a um, understanding you come to with a philosophy of organism anyway, because a thought is either an organism in um, Whitehead's um, characterization of it, uh, or embedded in, in an organism, right? So thoughts are part of the ecology of, of, of beings in, in, in a Whiteheadian universe. And all this kind of stuff about, consequently, imagination, uh, which is a word that we've um, disastrously diminished, is a um, method of, uh, of encounter. And the reason I'm saying that is that one of the most important Australian Aboriginal thinkers who although we certainly never deserved it, um, deigned to um, share aspects of Aboriginal understandings um, with the world, was a guy called Bill Naegi. And he has a, well, had, he's dead, had a very famous book called Story About Feeling. And um, one of his key things was that feeling is um, the most important aspect of indigenous thought as in the like, epistemological thought like this is how we validate the true um and and it's that's there in whitehead right so it's like um what does it feel like is um because we've had this well another bifurcation right like you can either go rational or empiricist um or, like we we have diminished feeling and it is literally the most important um epistemological framework for the oldest continually practicing conscious on earth. <laughs> and it's like there in Whitehead. And I find this is why I'm, I'm I have a renewed interest because I funnily enough I encountered him in a similar like McKenna Bob Wilson way at university based on some hand waving off when we were doing the postmodernist. So we learned what analytical philosophy was and whatever. And it's like and then there was this Whitehead guy and he was showing up in my own side reading if you will. Um, but I think of what Eduardo Rivera de Castro says about anthropology, and he says anthropology is nothing but comparing anthropologies, but also nothing less. So when you're doing this kind of cross, these words are all fraught, which is his point. When you're doing cross-cultural encounters for the purpose of non-extractive enrichment from being with other beings, right? Um, that's the nothing more. So it's two anthropologies encountering each other, but also nothing less because that's hugely important. When I think about, and this is not quite the right take, but when I think about which aspects of the so-called West um, are the most easily comparable to aspects of the so-called not West, the, the parts that, dare I say, overlap the most are the ones that attract my attention the most. And so centering of, of feeling as a part of, as an essential component of truth validation is one of those things that we find outside the, the quote unquote Western context. And also dare I say, in the best parts of, of Western thought, what do you reckon? Yeah, uh, you know, Whitehead says somewhere that um, philosophers have been obsessed with their visual experience and they have denigrated the feelings of the viscera. Uh, but for Whitehead, the secret to understanding our human cognitive connection to the natural world is through the feelings of the viscera. But we've, mm -hmm. we've uh, so violently severed ourselves as Western philosophers, uh, especially in the post-Cartesian modern context from those feelings in favor of uh, reflection, in favor of uh, concepts, and uh, in favor of uh, mathematical 
uh, uh, formulations that not that any of those things are unreal, but uh, if if we affirm that that abstract realm as the source of all truth, and we negate and neglect our feelings, we're only ever going to have a false understanding of the natural world. Uh, because for Whitehead, what what reveals the nature of nature to us uh, most immediately is our bodily experience, right? The 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 felt um, experience of being incarnate uh, and of of breathing, uh, of eating and defecating, uh, of of being a body, and it's yeah. the, the the way that um, our not just our physical senses, which tend to partake uh, participate in sort of constructing a a picture of the external world for us, but uh, feeling at an even deeper sense. Whitehead coins this term prehension, uh, by which he means uh, sort of the, the the vectors of causality that flow through our nerves. And we usually don't feel this unless we're wounded, unless there's something wrong with our body, then we can we have nerve pain or something. Usually our nerves are transparent to us and we kind of feel what the nerves are about. And that's like our visual experience of the external world uh, and as sort of the prototypical example. But Whitehead wants to direct our attention to the feelings of the body before that external world is projected around us because yeah. he, you know, he grants with, as the idealists have always been pointing out that uh, our visual perception of the external world is not necessarily the best model for the ultimate nature of reality. <laughs> No, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's funny, right? Like, um, the rationalists are wrong in the sense that you cannot have disembodied thoughts. They are they are in a context, right? So it, it could be uh, prehensive, but nevertheless, this is quite Heideggerian. Heideggerian um, that you there's no kind of like um, pure vacuum tube that you can sit in and have these unattached mathematical thoughts they're always in that kind of going along process of, of viscera of, of like to have thoughts especially if you think they're alive is an embodied experience and what I struggle with with the empiricists is that the statement that there's nothing um, beyond sense data is a statement beyond sense data like you're both invalidating the position so there's just there's so many this is kind of why I think anthropology is the most interesting form of philosophy at the moment because it's it's had to work out from a very, it, it came literally, for, it literally has skeletons in the closet and, and to go from that level to supposed to be the study of Anthropos and then realizing that human and person aren't the same thing and, and, and trying to kind of piece that together. It's like a philosophy of recovery <laughs> mm. that's happened because you, you get to at least as much as possible be with um, different theories of mind that can kind of show the, the shortcomings of the ones that we may have inherited in an unexamined way in, in a quote unquote Western context. But so another one, like, I don't know if, if there's something you want to say to that, but then afterwards, one last thing, because I think it's important for a kind of meandering, but really useful 101 on um, Whitehead is emergentism. But if you want to say something about that and then head into it, because I've kept you long enough, sir. Uh, oh, this has been so much fun. Uh, yeah. Gordon, so no, no, don't feel like you need to apologize for keeping me. I'm uh, really enjoying this. But yeah, just briefly on what you were saying about anthropology, I totally agree. I, I've really noticed that much of the best philosophy going on nowadays is, is in anthropology and theology. Yes. Um, philosophy, again, you know, analytic philosophy tends to dominate still, and I think I find it mostly pretty boring. Um, Whereas the, the anthropologists are going through this whole ontological turn, as they call it, mm -hmm. which I find really fascinating. And the, the theologians, um, they're the ones that are making these insightful connections between capitalist, the capitalist political economy and the sort of post-secular realization that actually, you know, as Latour would put it, we've never been modern. And the, the, theologians are doing some of the best philosophical cultural critique and reconstruction um so yes to that and then um 
uh, sorry, remind me what your emergentism is. The oh, emergence. Last... Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, so emergence is a really hot topic in uh, complex systems theory, which is is kind of like the f complex systems theory is like the farthest you can stretch materialism before it breaks into some sort of um, mystical incantation uh, because you know emergence is often offered by complexity scientists as a scientific explanation but you know as far as I can tell it's just hand waving it would be you know the idea that out of mere parts uh, holes can emerge that have capacities that you could not have predicted based on a complete knowledge of the parts. At least this would be, uh, I got a little moth on my camera. Uh, that would be what strong emergence theorists would, would, would argue for, that out of atoms which have no, uh, not even the residue of mind, no teleology, just blind, chance and uh, the laws of nature and these atoms will emerge into living cells which will then themselves blindly assemble and through natural selection emerge into human consciousness which is capable of something like science which then turns back and knows all of this stuff. Um, that's generally how complexity scientists think about emergence and I have gotten into some arguments with folks about how it's not that I don't think there's a role for something like emergence in nature. It's just that it we need to presuppose aim in nature. We need to so, presuppose yeah, yeah, yeah. experience in nature for emergence to even get off the ground. Because th that's sort of why I wanted to ask the question, because bear in mind, I'm, I'm kind of coming at how I understand Whitehead's notion of this via Dr. Sheldrake, but... Um, Whitehead had a way of saying, that, yeah, there, there, there are higher orders of truth. So there is like a, um, you can learn things that are differently true at another level. And I think that's why I wanted to, um, if I've got that right, you can please do correct, right? And I wanted to put that alongside this um, yet another um, bewilderingly incoherent um, modified neoplatonism that we call um, materialism like but my understanding is whitehead has a has a notion of kind of like not necessarily different um, but nevertheless true things on on different levels so there's like a a whiteheadian version not of emergentism but rather than going I'm remembering it from Dr. Sheldrake as um, we learn things are true by heading down and taking them apart at the moment. So the famous, like you put the laptop in the blender to learn out what's, what, to learn what's in your word processing software, right? Um, but there's actually, what we should be doing is going up. <laughs> it's like a, there's a verticality to um, learning true things. And I, I think that's why I wanted to ask the emergentism question. Yeah, I mean, Whitehead points this out. It's a different conception of what counts as a scientific explanation that uh, typically in the modern materialistic period, we've thought of explanation as having to do with explaining the more complex in terms of the less complex. Hmm. And from Whitehead's point of view, evolutionary theory, not just in biology, but in cosmology, we live in a time developmental universe now, we know this scientifically. Uh, why can't we reverse the usual order of explanation and say, okay, if conscious uh, organisms like human beings capable of science uh, have emerged, uh, what must be the case about the natural world that they emerged from? How are we to explain this complexity? Uh, you know, and rather than saying, oh, well, the universe can't be sort of um, irreducibly complex from the beginning, the universe can't be intelligent or in any way ensouled or animated prior to human consciousness, which is the materialistic assumption. What if we assumed that uh, interiority or aim or eros or some modicum of experience is just what it means to exist at all. And that 
from a simpler form of experience, more elaborate and complex forms could emerge. And that's Whitehead's cosmological wager. He says, let's try to explain the universe and the emergence of human beings with that assumption rather than trying to do the impossible, uh, which is to imagine the universe as atoms in the void and arrive somehow at the possibility of our knowing it as just atoms in the void. Mm. That, that's the bifurcation and the incoherence that Whitehead's critiquing. It's like, on the one hand, we want to affirm that we can have scientific knowledge, but we're describing via that scientific method, a universe that makes it impossible that we should ever have come to exist in the first place, right? So what it's yeah. saying, there's a more coherent way to go about this. Yeah, I love it. One more thing, because uh, like the um, uh, Eros is interesting, right? So um, why, unless I'm misunderstanding and I probably am, how he used that term, why didn't he use telos? Because it is kind of like a, um, a, a pulling from the future of, uh, of purpose, of telos. But why, why did he use... Um, like eros rather than something like telos or am i am i am i misunderstanding what he meant by eros i mean uh, i am not sure exactly why whitehead used eros i mean he talked in terms of teleology in some places in his writing but he was probably worried that teleology would be understood as uh the intelligent design theorist william yeah, paley yeah. understood it as a sort of external design right. whereas Eros gives more, um, it lends itself more to an interpretation that he, I think, wanted, which was that individual creatures have desires. Desire, uh, joy, becoming, love it. Yeah, and so he wants to distribute the teleology rather than it being one God that has this divine design that's stamped onto the material world. It's no, a pl proliferation of creative agencies, each one in a holographic way, uh, having fractally unfolded within it, this divine desire for beauty. And so each creature in Whitehead's universe, each organism in every moment of its existence is striving to achieve the most beautiful experience that is possible for it in its finite situation. Right. So I, you're probably right, and that's, that actually solved something that's been in my head for years. So you could say he had like a teleology of the erotic, which I like, I'm going to use that um, with caveats. And I think you're right that he didn't use it for the same reason that you can't until now in somewhere like biology, use the V word, use vitalism, because it will, it, it throws back to the wrong part of the history of human ideas because i would argue that actually if you go back to um, telos in the greek context it does look like um, what whitehead is talking about but in between then you're right that that's a very dangerous word when you're talking to scientists and philosophers of science at the time yeah thank you that solved something for me <laughs> good yeah Cool. All right. Well, this has been a super good chat. I had a, had a um, great time. We'll certainly have to do something like this again. I'd love that. Yeah. Um, but for people who want to know more, because you have um, so much, so much good news and medicine available um, out there in the world, where do they go to find out more about yourself and, and what you're going on and all that? Uh, footnotes, numeral two, Plato.com would be my main sort of philosophical factory. Uh, and my YouTube channel is zero thou art that zero. And, uh, I'm on Twitter too, way more often than I should be, uh, at thou, thou art that I believe. Yeah. No, I thought you were putting it to play. Well, maybe not. It doesn't matter for people watching this. You'll just look down below the video and you'll see, <laughs> you'll see the links. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, Matt, this has been a super good chat. Uh, really, really fun. And, um, and yeah, thank you so much for your time. And, um, and yeah, we'll do this again. Yeah, so glad to check Rune Soup off my bucket list. Thanks, Gordon. <laughs> nice one. <laughs> All right, I'm going to hit the stop button.